Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our BDD slash Bayer slash CPAR seminar. We are very excited to welcome Richard Zhang from Adobe, who will be making convolutional networks shift invariant again. Let's please give him a warm welcome. OK, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm a research scientist right now at Adobe. Um, but as of last year, I just uh, graduated from Ephros' group. So it's very nice to, to be here. All right. So these two images here are classified correctly. But these two are not. And the only difference between these two is a very seemingly innocuous shift operation. And in fact, I can just play this animation. And you see that the classifications are bouncing up and down as I'm simply sliding the, the image by one pixel at a time for kind of no reason at all. Now, this phenomena has been kind of discovered and characterized in some great recent work. Inspired by this work, we're actually looking to produce a fix. OK, so the first thing to note is that deep networks here are clearly not shift invariant. And to help fix that, we have to ask why. How is shift invariance lost? After all, we've all heard this mantra before. Convolutions are supposed to be shift equivariant. That is, if you move the image, the features should kind of move along with it. And pooling helps build up shift invariance. That is, it gives it a little bit of spatial slack. OK, so quick show of hands. Who's taken deep nets in, in a course or something before? OK, and who's heard this kind of statement made before? OK, great. So you're not lied to. These two things are true, but they're not the whole story. If they were the whole story, we would not see the phenomena in the slide before. What's not been kind of discovered or not, not been kind of told is that part of these networks is this striding operation. And striding, which is also known as subsampling and signal processing, um, ends up just ignoring the Nyquist sampling theorem and aliasing. And that's actually the problem here. Now, striding can be a part of both convolution as well as the pooling operation. But we'll first look at how it might affect the pooling operation. So let's just do a simple toy exercise together. Let's max pool this signal, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. OK, max of 0 and 0 is 0. Max of 1 and 1 is 1, and so on and so forth. And hopefully, you're, you're checking my math on this. Now, if I take the signal and slide it over by one index, I can do the max of 0 and 1, which is 1, and the 1 of 1 and 0, max of 1 and 0, which is 1, and we get this signal. Now, hopefully, we all agree that this signal and this signal are not the same thing. They're very different. And so here, in this very simple example, we've broken shift equivariance. We sh we've shown that by running max pooling with kernel 2, stride 2, we're not actually building up shift invariance. We've actually very easily broken shift equivariance. Now, this is a toy example. Frankly, I didn't have to try very hard to come up with it. But let's see if it actually happens in a more realis realistic scenario. So I can do CFAR classification with the VGG network. And if you're unfamiliar, the VGG network takes in pixels as input and has alternating layers between convolutions um, and nonlinearities, as well as pooling layers, which decrease the resolution. And eventually, after five pooling layers, you end up with, um, in this case, a one by one um, kind of signal with no spatial information and just a classification on the output. OK? And from here, we can actually go into each piece within the network and test how shift equivariant it is. Now, what shift equivariant actually means precisely is that you can take the image, x, you can shift it by a certain amount and extract the features, or you can do it the other way around. That is, these two operations should be commutable. So we can check each one of these internal operations to see how well they actually fulfill this condition. Now, there is one uh, kind of factor that we have to take care of as well, and that's the edge effects. Because as I'm sliding the image over, I'm by necessity deleting pixels on one side and having to make up pixels on the other side. And if we don't take care of this, then maybe the loss of shift invariance can be attributable to um, that kind of minor detail. So to get around that, for the purposes of having a clean test bed, we can use a simple signal processing trick. That is, we can use circular convolutions as well as circular shifts. And what that means is that if your convolution has hit the edge, you look onto the other side. And when you're sliding the image around, you slide it onto the other side as well. So the exact same pixels will be presented to the network. And if we do this, you wouldn't actually use it in practice in a system outside. But it gives us a clean test bed so that any deviation from this condition, any loss of shift equivariance, is purely attributable to the internals of the network. OK? So we can just go ahead and do this. We start with conv1. For different vertical and horizontal shifts, we can test that uh, shift equivariant condition. And here, blue means distance 0, which is that it's perfectly shift equivariant. And red means that it's a, a, um, deviating by a large amount. And we see that with COM1, um, it is perfectly shift equivariant. Okay, So you are 
Um, not lied to, convolutions are indeed shift equivariant. But if we go to the first pooling layer, we see this strange kind of stippling pattern occur. What we see is that for even pixel shifts, we actually get the same representation, but for odd pixel shifts, we actually get a different representation. Okay, so very practically, what does this mean? It means you're taking a picture of something, you start panning the camera, you move it by one pixel, and your pool one representation is now different. And you move it by two pixels, and now you have the same representation again. And this is probably not a property that you want in your common nets. And even worse, as we go through the network, if you go through each pooling layer, you can see that this pattern kind of persists, and the stippling pattern ends up increasing by a factor of two every time. So it's just getting worse and worse through the network. Okay, every pooling layer is increasing the periodicity here. Okay, so if you come from kind of a graphics or signal processing or image processing background, you might be kind of um, a little bit confused right now because we were taught in you know, sophomore level signal processing the proper way of downsampling a signal. We were taught that what you're supposed to do is not just subsample, you're supposed to blur the signal for subsampling. You're supposed to blur the signal as a means of anti-aliasing. And this is something that I remember being taught like uh, when I was you know, 19 as an undergrad. What's been found through very systematic um, evaluations in the deep learning community is that actually max pooling ends up performing empirically better. So about 10 years ago, deep nets weren't taking over everything like they are now. Um, we were still, or the deep learning community was still really trying to make things work. And they found that max pooling empirically works better than this mode of, of uh, downsampling a signal. So this is ultimately what, what we went with. Now here, what we'd like to do is see if that these two are actually reconcilable. So perhaps we can maintain the good performance of max pooling, but still have the anti-aliasing capability of um, kind of traditional image processing downsampling, right? So to do that, uh, we have to view these not as necessarily as alternatives, but perhaps as something that can be put together. Now to do that, we have to look at this max pooling operation a bit more closely. So max pooling, you can see, is that we're taking kind of disjoint two by two windows, for example, and taking the max. So we're taking the max at every other pixel. Now, conceptually, this is actually equivalent to two separate operations. So the first is you can take the max, but densely. That is, you can take the max, but do it in over, with stride one. So you have overlapping two by two windows. And the second operation is this subsampling step, in which case you take this intermediate feature map and take every other value. Now, practically, you would never implement it in this manner because um, it's not so efficient. But conceptually, this is actually very important. It allows us to isolate what's actually at fault here. So running the max operation, but doing so densely, not a problem. That actually preserves shift equ equivariance because you're running it at every single spatial location. The problem here is subsampling. Here's where we're ignoring Nyquist and getting into trouble. So the fix is actually um, quite straightforward here. The very logical thing to do is we take this and we copy and paste it. We keep it. We insert the appropriate signal processing fix. That is, we add a blur kernel as a means of anti-aliasing. And then we can keep the subsampling. Now, this is not um, going to do things perfectly um, because it's going to do uh, approximate anti-aliasing, which means that um, because you have a finite size kernel, um, you'll still have a little bit of aliasing. But with um, kind of some appropriate choices, you can greatly reduce the amount of shift equivariance lost. So here we can get, rid, um, get away with just small like 2 by 2, 3 by 3, 5 by 5 kernels, um, basically what people have been doing in image processing for, for a very long time. Okay, So these two operations can be evaluated as one. So this is all I'm asking you to do. Instead of one line of code, you have one, two lines of code. And that's it. Now you're kind of better following signal processing first principles. And so very quickly I can show you for our toy signal, run max, low pass filter it, self-sample it, and now you're a little less sensitive to this small shift. Okay, and I can show you for our CIFAR VGG test case as well. Uh, so this is after we do anti-aliasing, this was before, this was after, so before, after. All right, and you see that shift equivariance has been better preserved. Okay, now um, here, so far we've been motivated by the max pooling operation, um, but one kind of conceptual thing is that um, other operations such as strata convolution had the exact same problem. But the thing is we can actually apply the exact same conceptual fix as well. So we can uh, run conv at stride one as, and then do our kind of proper, um, our image processing or signal processing technique. Or we can replace average pooling with this technique as well. And this allows us to apply our methodology basically to any network that we take off the shelf. So let's go ahead and do that. So here I'm showing on ImageNet, on the y-axis I'm going to plot shift invariance. So this means that I take an image, I classify it, I shift it by 
uh, some number of pixels and I classify it and I check if these two classifications are the same. Now, we still do care if that classification is correct, so that's what I'll plot on the x-axis, the accuracy. And I can show a whole bunch of networks in this space, okay? Now, I'll note that uh, most of us, right, are quite obsessed with the x-axis. That's where a lot of engineering and GPU hours and um, research scientists' sweat has been put into, pushing these points to the right. Not as much has been put or um, attention has been paid to this y-axis. Now, my expectation before implementing this was that we would go up and to the left. So we'd probably get shift invariance, but we'd have to lose some accuracy because generally in the world, um, at least in my experience, life is kind of tough. Usually you don't just have cookies laying around just waiting to grab, right? Especially with this many people in the field. But to my kind of great surprise, I ran on VGG and got a boost. I thought surely this is some fluke. So I ran on everything and this is something I kind of consistently saw. So it turns out that on these um, networks that are actually very popular in literature, such as uh, VGG and ResNet, um, if we use kind of um, signal processing first principles, we could have actually improved the accuracy on a lot of these networks as well. Okay, great. So, so far I've talked about classification networks, um, but this isn't specific to uh, just classification networks. Um, many other types of networks use these building blocks as well. For example, um, this type of task is going from an input label map to trying to produce a good looking uh, photorealistic image of a facade. So in this case, each one of these colors you can read as a different semantic class like doors, windows, awning. And you're trying to map this into an image. Okay, and we can actually test how shift equivariant this is as well. So I can take this image, this label map, I can move it by one pixel, I can translate, and then I can move it one pixel back. And I can do that for a whole bunch of different shifts. And if this were, if the network were perfectly shift equivariant, as I'm doing this operation, you would not be able to see any deviation here in this output result, okay? But I'm going to do this and you're gonna see that, instead we see this kind of fun, weird pattern. So a lot of these things do stay static, but you'll see, for example, in the windows, um, it looks like the window bars are actually moving to the left. So sometimes you have one window bar, sometimes you have two, and then you oscillate back to one. And it turns out that the placement of where the window bars are actually coincide with the um, kind of subsampling structure within the details of the network. And so whether you get one bar or two is actually dependent on where you are relative, um, spatially relative to the network underneath. And so this might be fine, but it's something that you wouldn't immediately think of the network using uh, while solving these tasks. Now we can try to anti-alias it. Um, in this kind of image to image task, it's a little bit trickier because um, if you low pass filter too aggressively, you'll actually blow out a lot of the high frequencies that you actually do care. But you can be kind of careful and apply small filters like 1, 1 and 1, 2, 1. And it's not gonna fix everything perfectly, but you do see it is more steady. Some of the features are steady. For example, here, the network has decided to kind of produce a consistent crosshatch pattern rather than having, you know, one vertical bar shifting to the left. Okay, so um, a quick discussion is that if you have this line in your code anywhere, um, stride equals two, um, you're probably aliased right now, okay? And uh, what I'm proposing here is just something very simple. We can add an anti-aliasing filter. And in the classification setting, we see that we get improved shift, shift equivariance as expected. And we also end up getting improved accuracy kind of by chance. And I have additional studies showing that it also um, seems to make the network more stable to other types of perturbations, uh, such as rotations, as well as um, it can kind of improve um, the robustness to things like noise as well. Okay, so um, I'm here from Adobe. We take, you know, we take interns. Actually, the next speaker is an intern. I was an intern. Hopefully that's subtle enough. Um, okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much. All right, we have uh, five minutes for questions and there's a question already. Did you play with the uh, amount of anti-aliasing filter, like the, the, the bandwidth of it, to see if you can gain more either robustness or more shift invariance or more accuracy uh, if, if you did that? And what's the cost of doing that? Did, did sure. it result in more computation? Yes, okay, um, so two-part question. Yeah, the first part was uh, did I play with different filters? And I did, and so in the paper you can see um, just different things I tried, one, 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 two, one, uh, the one, four, six, four, one, which is, uh, what I showed here, and that's what's used in um, Gaussian pyramids, for example. Um, but there's definitely degrees of freedom there that you can you can play with. Um, in terms of speed. So what, what did you find? So if, mm -hmm. if you band limit your signal more, do you become even more shift invariant, and do you get even more accuracy? 
Right, so at some point you hit a trade-off where, right, if you are really aggressive, you're going to start blowing away parts of the signal that you actually want. So here's one way you can get perfect shift echo variance or shift invariance. Just always predict the, the, the zeroth answer. So you just blow your whole signal away, right? You get perfect shift echo variance, right? But you get 0% accuracy. So at some point you end up hitting this, this trade-off. Um, but it seems like from the point that we're at, which is not anti-aliasing, we can get some gains in both directions there to begin with. And then we hit kind of a Pareto front. Yeah. Okay, so the second part is if there's any kind of computation cost, and indeed there is because we're um, reducing stride, and that's actually the big cost. The low-pass filtering, not that expensive. Um, but I can uh, show this plot. So on the x-axis, it's runtime on um, a 2080 in this case, and here we're plotting different um, ResNet varieties. Um, and here are different um, low-pass filters that we used. And it turns out that um, even though, for example, going from anti-aliasing ResNet 18 costs more, um, you get gains on it. And it turns out the accuracy gains, at least for ResNet, seem to justify the increased computation. Um, and that's the, if you only care about accuracy. For um, shift invariance or consistency here, it, of course, is going to pay for itself very easily. So the, the runtime cost, the, the, the effect of three more, is that right? Uh, 25 to like 7 kilobytes. Where are you getting that? I'm reading the x-axis on the left-hand side. Uh, okay, so this point and... No, 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 so, hold on. These are different networks. So this is ResNet 18, this is ResNet 50. If you anti-alias ResNet 50, you go from this to this. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I didn't okay, great. Brian. Why is the uh, accuracy gain less and less as you go to a mm -hmm. method that has more and more layers? Right. I know it's an issue from security and so on. Sure. Okay, so the question is why, why is the accuracy gain smaller as we go to the right? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, if you look at any sort of factor, um, the accuracy versus that factor is probably going to go down. It's going to, you start getting diminishing returns. So this isn't just true of anti-aliasing. This is also true of adding layers. Like from here to here, we added 16 layers, right? From here to, okay, maybe that's not a good example. From here to here, we added 16 layers. From here to here, we added 50 layers. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's diminishing returns as kind of usual. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm curious about the uh, circular convs. And if those were just like in the experiment to measure the um, shift equivariance, or if that's actually something you recommend doing and what effects it has on boundaries. Yeah, okay, that's a good question, yeah. So in this case, the, um, the goal was just to have a very clean test bed so that um, you can't just say, oh, you're just dealing with boundary effects, right? So that was really the main motivation. I didn't evaluate quite the difference between circular convolution and zero padding, uh, but there's been work in, for example, in painting by NVIDIA that uses what's called partial convolution, sorry, partial, I think it's partial convolutions, which actually tries to think about zero padding and adjusting appropriately for that. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Nyquist sampling and uh -huh. how it breaks the striding, stri how it breaks with strides. Yeah. So I remember that Nyquist sampling was something about if you sample at like twice the highest frequency, you can yeah. Yeah. Uh, recover the original signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would, I mean, how does that, how mm -hmm. how is that at odds with having a higher stride. Okay, so what's happening when you're striding, right, is you have your original signal, it has a certain frequency characteristic, and then you stride. And if that frequency characteristic has any energy in the upper half, say if you're striding by a factor of two, when you subsample, that's going to alias into the lower half, and that's gonna break things, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. You have this interesting result that the shift invariance leads is correlated with higher accuracy. So I'm wondering, did you ever try to make those filters actually free parameters and see if you actually recover blurring? Yeah, um, that's something I haven't explored enough. I did leave it as free parameters, and the accuracy stays the same, and then the shift, or actually the, you don't get increased shift echo variance or shift invariance because it's not incentivized to, to kind of go for that. So it just learns whatever it wants to do to get higher accuracy. Um, but something I haven't tried, which I should, is actually building a shift invariance as a loss, um, and then leaving those parameters to be free. Yeah. Okay, uh, 